Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Randy Lennon is training us, and the title of his training session is The Right Questions Are the Secret to True Growth. Randy, would it be okay if I ask you a couple of questions so that the audience can get to know you? Absolutely not, Roger. I'm not into questions at all. So that, I take a pass. <laughs> in, in that case, I will do it. Now, Randy, we all know you as a, as a speaker, a trainer, and an author. Uh, but we don't really know about your business backstory. So fill us in, please. Well, I, I've been in business my whole life, really since age 14, uh, as a Dickie the Ice Cream Man. Uh, you're kind of in business for yourself because it's you're fully uh, you take the ice cream out and um, whatever you don't sell you have to pay for so I was even in business for myself at 14 and I my first actual business was at age 19 uh, I, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity through a mentor and an older guy who was like 35 at the time <laughs> he seemed old to me uh, he gave me an opportunity to come and work for him in a newspaper business in Barhead, Alberta. I passed because I didn't really want to go to Barhead at age 19. I was living in Edmonton, the big city. And um, he misinterpreted that to mean that he had to offer me a better deal. So when he had an opportunity to buy the Spruce Grove Examiner, uh, which was just outside Edmonton, uh, he didn't offer me a job. He offered me a partnership in the company. So that's a cool story. And that's how I got started in business. And I've been in business for myself ever since, except for six years when I was a police officer. And even during that time as a police officer, uh, I got my family going with, um, with a retail store, which we grew into a chain of three stores. And over those years, I've done <clears throat> all kinds of businesses, including my own recording artist management company, um, television production company. I've um, worked in the early days of the internet, actually in Vancouver with a company called Avenue One Entertainment, which some people may remember uh, David Chalk and Dave Chalk's company. We started it by doing conventional radio shows on CFUN in Vancouver. And then I had radio shows that were syndicated across Canada, including a show called Talk Hockey Saturday Night. Those were all my own businesses. I took a, a short stint to be an employee um, in early in 2003 because I got offered a job with the Calgary Flames. I maybe shouldn't say that on Vancouver, on a Vancouver um podcast here and uh, that i'm just a big fan i'm a lover of hockey so i took that opportunity and then after that i got into the uh investment banking business of all things so it was a it was a scottish gentleman from vancouver who became my partner he was my partner in the media business before i taught him the media business he said uh we're opening an office in calgary for our little uh, investment banking firm and uh would you like to open an office there? And I said, well, I'd be happy to. Uh, and what is an investment banker? <laughs> I didn't know anything about it. So I learned from him. We, we actually built up a fairly successful firm based in Calgary and, and, um, and uh, Vancouver. So I learned a lot about uh, the whole financial side of, of, I've always been an entrepreneur, ran my own businesses, built them from basically from scratch and whatever the bank would lend me. And I learned about this whole other world of, of financing through that. And um, yeah, so uh, a few other things thrown in there, being a political advisor in Ottawa for a year. And from a business perspective, um, that, that sort of covers it. Well, that's what you would call a pretty darn, pretty darn diverse, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's um, the positive way is to say that it's an eclectic background. <laughs> the other way to, uh, when you look through my LinkedIn, uh, people have said to me, oh, here's a fellow that's very defocused or can't, can't 
can't get a job, can't keep a job, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, I always say that uh, I'm really glad I'm 64 years old. So I'm glad I was born when I was because in all likelihood, I would have been put on Ritalin as a, as a kid because I, I think I'm a little ADHD. Uh, good. Now, with all the options available to you, uh, you are pursuing the questions experience. Why are you doing this as opposed to investment banking or some of the other things that have interested you in the past? Well, that is, um, you know, it's something that I've dabbled in since about 1990 is when I first got exposed to the whole concept of personal development or self growth. Um, in my in my 20s and early 30s, I was a bit of a bull in a china shop um, as a business person and I had success. And um, ever since 1990, when a book fell off the shelf uh, while I was on the ferry going from Vancouver to, to, um, to, uh, to uh, Vancouver Island. Uh, and the book was Your Sacred Self um, by Dr. Wayne Dyer. And when I opened that book and I started reading it, um, I realized there's, I'm, I'm missing something here. And so over from 1990 to today, along with my journey as a business person and as a father and a husband and, and a friend, along with that journey, I've also had this parallel journey, a spiritual journey of uh, becoming um, more aware of all of the stuff that, you know, we can't touch or feel that doesn't necessarily meet the eye. So, um, and, and in 1998, around there, um, I experienced one of my many humbling situations. I've been humbled many times since 1990 with business failures and, and uh, divorce and uh, bankruptcy and all kinds of um, uh, obstacles that came on my path. And uh, in, in 1998, I decided to pursue um, a, a, a business venture that was really about, um, it, it, was, it was called the Biz Brainstorm. We did it out of our home in West Vancouver. And I started doing some workshops. I'd done all kinds of experiential training. And, um, and I, was, I was blessed kind of, I, I really do believe that I was guided and given these eight questions. And in my book that I just released, the, the, the Dirty Words, give a little plug for it right here, The Dirty Words, um, you can, there, it tells a little bit of the story about how that happened, and we'll get into that tonight. And, um, and so from 1998 until 2020, on March 12th, when for me, COVID officially began, <laughs> because they canceled the NHL season. That, that to me was the end of the world. Um, I uh, have dabbled and uh, used the questions and used the dirty words training. And a couple of times along the way, I even started a website. I actually formed a company and started working with these questions in a more formal way and never ever focused on them. When COVID hit, um, like many of you on this call, I'm sure your world's sort of upside down. And in my case, I just decided to step back. And at age 64, I just decided, what is, what is my, you know, I've, I've done all these amazing, fun, incredible things and pursued businesses and, and been a television personality, radio host, stuff that I really love doing. Uh, where, where is the legacy going to come from? And what have I really, what am I going to leave behind? And that's when I came back to the questions. And I realized that over all those years, even dabbling with it, I had uh, calculated that I'd probably worked with about a thousand people, either one-on-one -on -one or in some of the workshops that we did over the years. And by going through these eight questions with people, I had I had every single one of those approximately a thousand people 
have some kind of uh, awakening and in some times, in some cases, a lot of cases, a major breakthrough. So I just realized that this is a gift and it's time for me to focus on it. So instead of pursuing all these fun businesses, yeah, even investment banking can be fun and interesting too. Um, I just decided it's time to it's time to accept what I truly believe is a calling for me, and that's to share these questions with the world. Great, thanks, Randy. Um, audience members, uh, the recording of uh, Randy's training session will be made available no later than noon tomorrow and uh, maybe even as soon as before I go to bed tonight. Uh, in any event, you'll get a link to it. So there's no need for you to take notes unless of course you want to. Uh, Rand Randy, are you ready to rock the stage? Yeah, it's a very interesting stage because I'm used to being on an actual stage. So, and, and part of um, my joy in doing, whether it's a questions experience or even when I was a stand-up comic or hosting, uh, entertainment talk shows with a live audience is the interaction with the audience. So I'm going to ask you, Roger, if it's okay that we open it up for people to unmute at any time through the process here, and I may throw out some questions. Uh, please engage with me and just jump right in uh, through our session, if that's okay with you, Roger. Yep, that's totally fine. And then for those of you that may have a question or a comment uh, and you're not comfortable to unmute and, and, and sort of step up to the mic, so to speak, um, you're welcome to use the chat and Roger will follow the chat and cut in with any questions. Great, take it so away. With that, um, I am gonna share with you today about not only the questions, which are these eight questions that we've just been talking about that I've been gifted with and are the focus of a business venture called The Questions Experience, uh, which you can find at thequestionsexperience.com. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you um, the concept that it's really all about the questions. If you wanna, be more effective in your business or actually in any aspect of your life, you have two ears and one mouth. And a very wise person said to me quite some time ago, use proportionally. So if you are um, in a conversation with anybody that's important to you, and that would range from a potential client or one of your customers, one of your staff in your company, your partner in business, and even more so in your personal relationships, particularly with your children. It's all about listening first and speaking after. Two ears, one mouth used proportionally. Now, I've been um, selling my whole life. I'm, I'm a gifted salesperson and I can be very convincing uh, as a salesperson. And I was actually quite successful in building my own businesses and convincing people to follow me and in, in my 20s or even my first business, a weekly newspaper business going out there and selling advertising. And I was so handicapped in how I was doing it because I thought influencing people or getting someone to do something that I want them to do or to buy something or to, for my own children to listen to me, to do what they're told, to, to influence people, I thought it was about how effective I could be in making my case, making my presentation, getting the message across, how careful I was with my words and my language and how enthusiastic I was and all of, and my body language and all of this, all of these factors. And it's true. Those are all very, very important factors. And unless you start by listening instead of speaking and start by asking questions 
and particularly the right questions, you're 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 going into the you're you're going into a, a gunfight, you know, with a with a knife. <laughs> you're not armed effectively now. So it's it's all about the questions. Now, as I say that, can I ask the because again, here I am and Roger saying, you know, train us about what you're doing. And here I am talking and I haven't, I haven't asked any questions. So let me ask uh, anybody that wants to pipe up. Um, is there anything that I've said there that is a revelation for you? Or does everybody already know what I just said? It's all about, it's more for selling or influencing or learning about or teaching your kids or influencing your people. Uh, you already knew that it's all about asking questions. Any comment on that? I think that, um, Enrique here, I think that more than and anything, I think that I would like to comment on the fact that sometimes because we're so involved with those, even though things may be obvious, um, you know, when somebody else says it, it resonates and it reinforces the fact that you should be doing these things. And then you've been thinking about it, about, you know what? Yes, that is the way it's supposed to be. That's the way we're supposed to be doing it. So, so-and-so saying it is validating it. So to me, that's the way it comes across. So I think that most, for the most part, we may already know these things, but again, it's, it's different. Sometimes it just takes that extra voice to click in, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Anybody in, else want to comment or? In, in my opinion, you don't sell anything to anybody. It is the person who wants to buy something when the sale takes place. There's an old expression in sales that people love to buy and they hate to be sold. Yes. So um, I've always been a very strong influencer of people and, and persuasive and persistent. And I've also found, especially in my personal relationships and even my business relationships, that I've been pushing things on people. People would rather be led as opposed to being pushed. They'd, they'd rather be pulled along than to be pushed or to feel pushed or pressured. And when you're in any kind of situation where you're, you're wanting to influence another person, it's when, when you really stop and think about it, start with questions because you, you may be making a case for example, just now, I, I want to throw it out there. Does everybody already know what I'm talking about? <laughs> In which case, let's move on and talk about something else. So when we approach any situation, um, whether it's a, an interaction in your business with a potential client or some, someone walks into your store, someone um, even making a call, a cold call, even in crafting an email out to somebody that you want to engage with, um, if you start with the questions, you're, you're giving yourself a huge head start. And you'll often find out exactly how to tailor what you want to present by asking questions up front. So, for example, um, the, I always I always look at a meeting. So, how many of you here today um, had a meeting, an online meeting, or met with someone today, or had a cup of coffee? Everybody, put your hand up. Let's see if you anybody have meetings today. Yeah. Okay. So, how did the meeting go from your perspective? Good. Anybody, anybody have the experience they left the meeting and they kind of go, you know, that really didn't, it, we never got in the flow and it didn't really go well. We've all experienced that as well, right? Here's a great way and you can, you can write this one down. 
here's how to tell how well the meeting went, or here's how to tell how the, this particular conversation that you just had with your spouse or with your kids or with your business partner, here's a good rule of thumb to decide to analyze and assess how well it went. Anybody got any ideas of what that might be? If, if you get the outcome of what you were expecting, then you can say the meeting went well. That's a good way. That's one way. I've got a, a foolproof assessment tool for you here. Anybody know what it is? No. Can you ask them? That's a good, yeah, at the end of the meeting, you ask that question. So, and again, you can, you can plan your questions. It, it, think of the amount of time we put into planning a presentation and how we're going to get, we, we very carefully line up how we're going to get our message across. Plan the questions that you're going to ask with the same amount of care. So, for example, was that you, Romana, that said that? Just ask at the end of the meeting? Yes, it was. What would, what would be a question you could pose? Um, maybe you could ask, how are you feeling after? Or, or, well, I guess you could start off with asking if they have any questions. And then maybe right. you can address them. Um, and then maybe ask them how they feel about it. And if there is anything that could be different based on the outcome that was provided. Perfect. Anybody else with um, a question you could ask at the end to help you determine how effective the meeting was? I, I always ask that, did the meeting serve the purpose with which you came initially? That's a great one. Um, so yes, that's a, that's a way of analyzing and assessing how well the meeting went. And I've got another way, last chance for someone to figure it out. This Do might you have any question? Pardon me. I I just had some uh, some input. Um, this might not be leading to um, what you're saying, but uh, after every meeting that I typically have with the clients, I always ask them at the end, "Is there anything that has been left unsaid, or anything further that you would like to inquire more?" to add that extra layer of value. Excellent. Excellent, that's all great stuff. So here it is. Here is a foolproof way to determine whether the meeting, the interaction, the, the serious exchange with your teenager, here's how to tell how well it went. Calculate the amount of time that you talked compared to the amount of time that they talked. Whoever ended up listening more wins. So if you have a, if you, if you look back on your meeting today, that you, most of you said you had a great meeting today. Think back, did you, were you talking more than 50% of the time? Because if you were, the meeting may have gone well. And I guarantee you that if you can make sure that the person you're meeting with ends up talking more than you do, and if it's a group of people, for sure, you want to be the person who spoke the least. If that's what happens, and if you can get it up to 60, 70, 80%, the other person talking, you have had a great meeting. So, now, does anybody want to challenge me on that? Randy, I have a question on this. Okay. If the, if the purpose of the meeting is to explain to the person about my company, who we are, what we do, and how we do it, don't you think that I will be talking more than what that person is going to be talking? Depends if you want to be more effective or not. My answer to you is it 
absolutely applies when you're having a meeting about your company and what you offer. So in and that case, would, how do you, in that case, how do you determine whether the meeting went well or not? The more they talk, the better the meeting went. Okay. So here's, here's, and you can, you can test this out. The next time you're going to have a meeting with someone and let's say your, your sole intention is to make a sale. You want to sign them up for your product, you, your service, you want to, and in your case is shock. I understand you, you have a relatively complicated offering. Okay. I would say this, if you can ask them questions about them and get them talking about themselves and just keep on asking more and more questions. Now you, it's very important. I'm going to make a proviso here. You can't just be doing this, um, you know, as a, as a concept or a system, you truly have to ask questions that you're interested in. So, you know, you, if I'm going to sit down with you, Ashok, I asked you before this meeting started, uh, tell me about yourself. Right. And you, you said a couple of things. I said, well, and what, what did you do before that? And then we got into the ice cream, right? You yeah. remember that? Yeah. If I'm not interested in, in, your ice cream story and I'm just pretending it's not going to work. So be actually curious and ask questions and keep asking questions until the person finally gets to the place where they go. Let's face it. Uh, Vin. Okay. I see you Vin. Just unmute yourself for a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you ever, if you get into a conversation with someone, what kind of business are you in by the way? Um, uh, professional speaking and until yesterday, management consulting. Hey, congratulations. Uh, so if you, uh, does any of this resonate with you? For example, if you're uh, professional speaking, so you're looking for speaking engagements, correct? Correct. correct so let's yeah. say you're having a call with someone who's thinking of hiring you as a speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, did, would it make sense to you to ask them a bunch of questions and get to know them? First. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's, a, there's a series of questions that will lead to understanding more about uh, the, you know, the, the speaking engagement and also what is included, what is offered, and also getting to understand the audience that I would be speaking to. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I'll take it a step further. You have a set of questions that, you're, that, that you've determined Help you, help you not only convince them to hire you as a speaker, but to help you put together a better presentation for them. So you have that set of questions. Of course. I'm going to get you all to think about this for a second. Going forward, let's say you have an hour set aside for a meeting. Remember, I said to you, it's going to be a successful meeting if you listened more than 50% of the meeting. Okay, just play ball with me now. So Vin, let's say you got a um, let's say you got a half an hour set aside with a person who could potentially hire you to be a speaker. Don't even go to the questions no. about the speaking engagement. Just ask them questions and get to know them, and Correct. keep asking questions. And what you're going to find is a few different outcomes can happen. One is they get talking about themselves and you're, you get joking back and forth and you're, you're getting, you're getting to really know that person. And they realize 10 or 15 minutes into the discussion, they go, Oh, we, we've already used 15 minutes. Anyway, we're having a good time. Anyway, let's get down to business. Right. Mm -hmm. They, if, if, if they talk about themselves the entire 30 minutes, What's going to happen then? They realize they're out of time. You're going to want to schedule another call to be able to get to know more about you and they'll be more interested in you. So absolutely, I can definitely see where that's going. Yeah, like just keep asking questions <laughs> until they, I mean, this applies to like dating, for example, or like if you're meeting someone for the first time and 
believe me, I wish I would have known this like 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. I only just learned this in the past little while, like the past few years. And here I am, you know, my company is now called the Questions Experience Company. So I've had this whole questions thing in front of me all this time. And yet here I am, I just learned this. So try it out, okay? Just keep asking questions about them, learn about them, and sooner or later. And it, this is a fantastic tool in any kind of networking situation. People think I'm going to go network, I'm going to meet people, and I've got to give my business card, and I've got to, I've got to tell them about what I'm doing, and hopefully I'll find someone that wants to buy from me or refer me to someone. No, that's not what you're there for. You're there to get to know people and learn about them. And it's the way it works. You ask enough questions. I've had scenarios where it's an hour meeting and we're at the 48, 50 minute mark. And I'm just thinking, this is so cool. I guess we're gonna have to either extend the meeting or reschedule. And there's no way that I am gonna stop and cut in when that person is enjoying the conversation. And let's face it, what do we most like to talk about? Any ideas? Ourselves. Themselves, yeah, ourselves. We want to talk about ourselves. Randy, I, Roger, Roger here. When, whenever you keep asking people questions, don't they feel somewhat interrogated? That's a very good comment because that has happened to me, okay? In, because I'm, and remember, I'm also a professional interviewer. Like I've interviewed, I don't know how many, well over a thousand people on television and radio. So, so I have an excuse. I say, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a natural professional interviewer. So again, you don't want to do it in any kind of fake way. I mean, you generally have to be interested in what you're asking. And, and when you ask them about, you know, what they did, what, what, what do you do? Tell me about your family, whatever. I've had people say to me, well, I don't really want to get into my family. Let's get down to business. Well, okay, that's fine. So then I move into the business questions. It's still about questions. And when I'm asking, like, for example, um, you know, earlier when we got on early here and um, I forget who it was. Oh yeah, a shock, right? A shock when I started asking you questions, I, I didn't just, I, I, it wasn't like an interrogation about the ice cream, right? I, I, I also piped up and said, hey, hey, my what's your favorite flavor? I just said what my favorite flavor is. So it's an interaction. So it can't be fake. It's got to be real. And, and if you're not a naturally curious person about people, you're probably not going to do that great in having your own business or, or that involves anything to do with sales or influencing, if that makes sense to you. So is that a um, question? Is that something that, you know, some people say, I, I'm not a natural sales. I'm not into that. I'm not a salesperson. So I'm not going to do this kind of thing. So, sh I mean, I know that there's training materials, there's training seminars, there's training that they can do, but as ultimately can a person become a you know, charismatic and, you know, and if they don't have it naturally or will they always force themselves or feel like they're forcing themselves or those unnatural tendencies might come through? Well, that's a very interesting question. And that's a, that's a whole seminar in itself. <laughs> Can we, um, you know, we're, we're programmed um, through our, you know, from zero to eight, zero to seven. And then from there on, we continue to get programmed. And, um, you know, one of the people that I really follow, Dr. Joe Dispenza, describes it this way, that by the time you hit 35 years old, uh, your subconscious mind has been programmed and you're operating about 95% on autopilot. And if you've decided at that point that, or you make a proclamation to yourself, like many people do over and over again, well, I'm not a very good salesperson, or 
you know, I'm more of an introverted personality. Well, are you? Or, I mean, is that reality? Or is that a story that you have been told or you've told yourself that you buy into and that's who you are and you're happy with that? So personally, right now, I'm um, convinced that uh, I don't need to be held back by what's in what's been programmed in me and my self subconscious over the years I can change that and I literally can become a different person remember I used to be a person that was shoot ready aim bull in a china shop today I'm learning to slow down and ask more questions and find out what I'm speaking into before I start speaking. So we're at the 40 minute mark and I, I, want, I do want to share a few more things that I promised you here. And that's about um, improving your business by being a better coach and more open to coaching. And by the way, I'm actually recruiting people to become coaches within the questions experience company. We're looking for either people who already are certified coaches or who, for people who aspire to become a coach. We have a training program to become a certified questions experience practitioner. So let's just talk about coaching for a second. What does it mean to be a coach? You know, unmute yourself and give me some feedback on that. What makes a good coach? Someone who asks the right questions. Aha, <laughs> exactly, exactly. The questions experience, I have this set of eight questions which have been given to me and they're very powerful questions. And even just by answering the questions, people get awakenings and breakthroughs. And yet, if they open themselves up, if they're willing to engage with someone else, especially someone who's a trained coach, to discuss their answers to their own, to these very, very powerful questions. You know, the last one being, what is your purpose? Huge question if they're willing to engage with someone else and discuss them and maybe look at changing their answers, um, there's a lot of potential growth there. So what does a questions experienced certified uh, practitioner do? They ask more questions. They ask you to go a little deeper on what your answer is to that particular question. So, Coaching, um, yes. When we think of a, of a coach, like in sports, for example, coaches, um, it's, it's interesting that the fastest man in the world who's got the world record for the 100-yard dash, he has a coach. Like, that's kind of bizarre. He's the fastest guy in the world. <laughs> so what does he need a coach for? Well, the coach doesn't necessarily have to be better than you at what you're doing. The coach is just effective in helping you to become better. And how do you become better? By asking the right questions of yourself. Now, can someone give me an example of that, how that works? Um, how you can be effective in coaching your children as opposed to telling them what to do for example how you can be more effective in coaching your employees or your associates anybody got any ideas about that well one of the things that i do for my team and my agency is um, talk about through stories whether it's my own personal stories or something that you know has impacted me or or to a certain extent but 
the but I think that you also have to be passionate. Um, coaching, I think, is not something that you can just be trained to do and then you you automatically do it. If you're a salesperson, for example, and you want to be a coach, you always want to be selling. You know, uh, where I think that if you really enjoy it and you're you're in it because you actually want to make a difference, whether you want to see that person develop, whether you want to see them succeed, whether it's in business or whatnot, I think that that is ultimately what is going to make the, the bigger impact where people can understand, like you just said earlier about the questions, when they come out as an interview or as a, you know, just, just asking the questions just for the heck of it, the people can tell when you're BSing, when you're not genuine. So I think that equally the same thing with coaching, if you're passionate, that passion is going to come out and it's going to resonate with your client or your audience or whatever the setting may be. Yeah, absolutely. And being authentic is, is crucially important. I'm, I'm sharing with you the difference. I'm, I'm asking you to change your mindset because a lot of times we believe we go into any particular scenario and we believe we need to get our message across somehow. We've got to perfectly do the presentation. And I'm saying, think first about the questions that you're going to ask and about finding out about the other person. And, and before you start to um, influence the other person, and again, whether it's your potential client, your customer, or your teenager, you're going to do much better if you first attempt to find out where they're at what are they going to be open to how are they going to be open or not open to hearing your message so it, it coaching and being open to coaching like being a more coachable person again it involves the two ears one mouth used proportionally. Now, um, the questions experience itself um, is a one day workshop, or in the case of coming up actually this weekend, we're doing a, a half day workshop in, in Vancouver on Sunday. Uh, and it is, people do get the opportunity to answer these questions and then work in a group setting to review their answers and find their breakthroughs and awakenings through those, through, through those answers. We also, as a setup to get people ready to answer the questions, we do what's called the dirty words training. And I'm going to take a few minutes now to share with you a little bit about that. How are we doing for time, Roger? Roger, you're muted. Uh, we've got 14 minutes to, uh, 14 minutes, yeah, 14 minutes, but we started a little bit late. So somewhere around about 15, 16, 17 minutes. Okay. Because I'm used to being right on the clock. So I want to know if there's a hard stop here right at the top of the hour. How's everyone doing, by the way? Are we, are you with me? I, I got to look through here to see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so let's talk about the dirty words for a second. And again, I'll share with you this book, the dirty words book. It's available um, on Amazon, of course, and also apparently Indigo and chapters have ordered it in the Vancouver market or wherever you are, Barnes and Noble in the U S has it. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what we're talking about today, I, I strongly suggest you pick up that book and read it. So the dirty words, what are the dirty words? Well, we know about uh, those dirty words. You know, the seven words you can't say on television. Does anybody know those words? Actually, we won't go into them right now, right, Roger? Well, <laughs> there, that's an old George Carlin uh, sketch. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep we'll keep those for another time. Yeah, and uh, the interesting thing is six out of seven of them you can say on television now, and that's another story. 
So yes, we know about the swear words, the foul language, the, the, the F word that, you know, we learn to swear at actually a fairly young age. I actually, in the workshop, I asked people, when did you first learn to swear? And uh, it, the, the responses are interesting. Those are not the dirty words that we're referring to in the book. However, we make the comparison of seven other words that are not the seven words you can't say on television. You're more than welcome to say these seven words on TV. They are have to, should, but, try, can't, hope, and wish. And by the way, in the Dirty Words Workshop, there's those seven, there's probably 20 or 30 uh, dirty words that people can come up with. What are they when we're not talking about swear words? These dirty words have to, should, but, try. These are words that are so common in our vocabulary, we use them without even thinking. And yet, in a lot of cases, in certain contexts, these words can actually be destructive. They do not serve us. And they do not, um, they're not effective in, in, in communicating with communicating with clarity and intention. So what am I talking about? Let's use, let's use them. The easiest one is to figure out is the word, but now, can we all agree that we could simply eliminate, but from our vocabulary, or is there anybody that wants to challenge me on that? You have to unmute if you want to speak up. Another word I think should get eliminated, sorry, is the I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know could be one. And let's, I'm just going to go through but quickly though, okay? So anybody, could you go through the whole day tomorrow and not say the word but? But is not a good word because... Whatever we've just said prior to saying the word but, we've just negated it. Talking about your teenage son or daughter. I love you, but I'm really angry with you right now. I love you, but I'm, you, you didn't take out the garbage and I'm upset about it. And when are you blah, 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 blah. They don't hear the I love you part when you add but afterwards. We would never ever consider in a very important language, uh, in very important scenarios where the language is very important, i.e. maybe your wedding vows. Can you imagine someone, um, do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband, sickness and in health, till death do you part? And the woman goes, I do, but <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen, okay, because uh, I do, but then there is the, we have the prenuptial agreement. So, but is a word that we use all the time, and we don't really mean but, because if we meant but, why would we say what we just said? Um, Roger, you know, I'm really enthusiastic about uh doing this, uh, this uh, webinar, uh, but I'm concerned about whether I'm going to have the time or the scheduling of it, okay? Well, as soon as I say but, I've negated what I just said. So what's the solution? How can we replace the word? And by the way, you can do this for the rest of your life now, now that you figured this out. There's a simple substitute word for but. Anybody know what it is? Whenever I'm tempted to say, but I substitute and for, but. And perfect. And. Yeah. Perfect. Son, I love you. And you know, I'm really proud of you. And I'm really pissed off at you right now. <laughs> it's a subtle difference and it makes a huge difference. Looking at the clock. Let me throw out another one to you have to. 
Anybody say the words have to quite often in your vocabulary? You'd be surprised how many times you do. I'm going to tell you a quick story about but, have to, try, can't, hope. I'll use them all in the same sentence. And this is a true story. So I'm driving my son to a hockey practice. And he's like 10 years old. And uh, he's 21 now, so 11 years ago. We did have Bluetooth in the car already back then. So a phone call comes in, and it's my buddy. He says, hey, Randy, uh, a bunch of guys, we're going to go meet over at the pub uh, in the next 15 minutes. Do you want to join us? And I say, oh, I'd love to, but I can't. I mean, I could try to get there and, you know, I should really take a break, but I have to take my son to hockey practice. Now that is a sentence laced with dirty words. And what's the result? My son sitting in the back of the car is thinking, oh, my dad would rather be going to the pub with his friends and he's stuck with taking me to hockey. Now here's what's really sad about that, what I just described to you. All those dirty words I, re I was using, they were actually lies. That's not the way I felt about it. I actually love taking my son, Chris, to hockey. And when I say, oh, I can't, that's not true. I could if I wanted to. I could choose to go there instead. So it's not that I can't, okay? Um, I will try to make it. Well, no, I'm not going to try to make it. I'm going to the hockey practice. I really should, but I can't because I have to take my son to hockey. It's all a lie. It's not even true. Here's what I could say instead. They phone. Hey, Randy, do you want to come down to the, to the pub? Now, let's be clear. A lot of the dirty words are used to try to be nice or to soften the situation, not to hurt anybody's feelings. These guys don't, they're, they're not going to be hurt if I simply say, oh, hey, thanks for the invite. I'd love to come. And I'm not coming because I get to take my son, Chris, to hockey. We've substituted have to with get to. And you could substitute, I'm going to, or I choose to, which is much better because this have to thing is like, what, someone else is running your life? There's some, some, some other control factor. You're not making your own choices. Oh, I have to do this. I have to do that. No, I choose to say I get to. So even if I use the same language, if I use the same tone of voice, okay? Oh, thanks for inviting me. No, I'm not going to be there because um, I get to take Chris to hockey. My son's beaming. And that's how I really felt. And yet I'm using dirty words. Another one, just quickly, and the book is full of all the explanations to get into this deeper should. Do you ever use the word should? Maybe you said to someone, hey, there's this interesting webinar about questions and dirty words. You should, you should join us on the webinar. Uh, do you ever use the word should? You know, oh man, am I getting fat? I should really get in shape. <laughs> I should, I, I should, I should go on a diet. Okay. Do you realize that you're shooting all over yourself? And worse still, you're shooting on other people. People don't want to be told what they should and shouldn't be doing. And you don't, there's no requirement for it because there's a perfect replacement. 
for using the word should. Anybody know what it is? It's going to take us full circle, by the way. Anybody know a replacement for whenever you're about to say the word should about yourself or to others? Suggest. Pardon me? I suggest. I suggest. Yeah. Sounds a little bit better than should. Must. And you're still giving them advice that they may or may not want. Okay. Anybody got another idea? Uh, I will go for that. Instead of saying you should go for this event, I will go for this event. Yeah, you could offer to do it yourself. Here it is. We'll go full circle. Whenever you're about to say should to someone else, ask a question instead. Uh, Junior, have you thought about taking out the garbage? <laughs> Have you thought about, um, would you, hey, there's this webinar on tonight. Uh, would you be interested in a webinar about the dirty words and, and the questions? See the difference? Big difference. Small change in language. And then shitting on yourself, okay? Every time I find myself saying, well, I should do this or I should do that, just catch yourself. And realize, no, either say you're go either say I'm going to do that, I'm I'm going to lose weight, or I'm getting on a diet, or shut up, <laughs> stop talking about what you should be doing. Like either do it or don't. Same with try. Anyway, that is what I have to share with you tonight, and uh, I'm just using. It's very very weird to not be able to see you all at the same time. Some of you have your cameras on and some not. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining me tonight. For those of you that are watching uh, at a later date, um, love to connect with you anytime. I'm easy to find thequestionsexperience.com. Um, Randy at TQ for the questions experience.com randy at tq experience.com and i'm on i'm on uh, linkedin facebook twitter randy lennon thanks everybody randy uh, on behalf of vbn and uh, all our online listeners uh, thank you for sharing this uh, uh, with us uh, i for one uh, put a little check mark to every one of those words that i shouldn't sorry shouldn't uh, be using uh, but now I will be much more intentional. Thank you for bringing that outcome to pass. Thank you all. I, I'm going to stop recording.